Okay, we are back with another UFC predictions here on the channel. The main event this weekend from the UFC Apex, Song Yedong versus Ricky Simone in the Bantamweight division. 12 fights on this card this Saturday night from, again, the Apex in Las Vegas. Let's get into it. It's, it's, an, it's a decent card with decent names. It's not the best card you're ever going to see, but it's a UFC card. And folks, if you haven't yet, though, make sure to hit that subscribe button down below for some more UFC here on the channel. On average, about 67% of you who watch these videos are not subscribed to the channel, so make sure to hit that subscribe button down below for more UFC every single week. So our first fight is in the Bantamweight division. We have got Haley Cowan finally making her UFC debut, hopefully this Saturday, against Jamie Lynn Horth for Haley, for Haley Cohen. We've talked about her before on the channel twice, actually, against Aline Perez and Tamaris Vidal. Both those fights have not happened. First fight against Aline Perez, uh, Haley Cowan had a plot due to, an, due to an illness, and then her fight against Tamaris Vidal. Vidal could not make it to fight night. So now we get Cowan versus Jamie Lynn Horth. It will be Cowan's third scheduled fight in three months against a third different opponent, and we're going to see what she can do here against Jamie Lynn Horth, who is the reigning um, LFA strawweight. It's not strawweight, sorry flyweight champion winning that championship back in late 2021 did not fight in all of 2022 had a fight booked against Sabina Mazo. Mazo, the former UFC fighter who got cut for the promotion after a three fight losing streak was booked in LFA against Jamie Lynn Horth um, late into 2022 that fight canceled now Horth getting the shot in the UFC against Cowan um Again, though, it has been the inactivity inactivity out of Jamie Lynn Horth. We haven't seen her in a while since 2021. Again, when again she won that LFA World Championship. Really good wrestler, really good jujitsu game out of Horth as a whole. She can get it done on the feet as well, but primarily it's going to be the grappling at Jamie Lynn Horth that is going to win her fights. She'll be taking on Haley Cowan here, and I think for Haley Cowan, she'll have the advantage in terms of size. Of course, she is the bigger she is the bigger fighter. She's a fighter that does normally fight at 135 pounds. She won on the Contender Series by split decision. It's a fight that the UFC she gave her the contract. I wasn't really sure why, honestly. I mean, I think we can all have our assumptions why Dana White decided to give Haley Cowan the, the uh, contract in the UFC, but really, I mean, it wasn't that impressive of, of a fight. She wins it by decision, and now she's in the UFC. Um, fought in Invicta before that, but I mean, was one and one in her last two fights going in to the Contender Series, fighting against Kelly, Kelly Clayton in, in 2020 in a, in a fight, uh, main event, or in a fight card um, that was main evented by uh, Chidi and Joe Kuwani. But Haley Cowan goes in there, gets submitted by a fighter who was one and two at the time, and Clayton, who's now two and two, who has not fought since that Haley Cowan fight in 2020. It's just concerning considering Cowan's fight before that against Brittany Cloudy, a fighter who was two and one going into that fight. She barely wins it by split decision and for cloudy she went 0 and 4 and invicta and is now 4 and 5 professionally it's just concerning when you look at cowan's body of work before the ufc about how she has been beat on the ground before victoria leonardo a former ufc fighter as well beat her it was uh, both both fighters professional debut but still again cowan has been beat on the ground and she's now getting a fighter again in horth who is a primary grappler who has you know won a lfa championship with her jiu-jitsu and with her ground skills. Again, the only saving grace in this fight, though, for Haley Cowan is definitely that she is the bigger fighter. She is the natural bantamweight, and she's taking on a flyweight coming up to 135 pounds. But still, I think the skill advantage goes to Jamie Lynn Horth, and I think Horth is the better ground fighter. I think that's what's going to propel her to victory. So give me Jamie Lynn Horth, the reigning LFA uh, flyweight champion, to win this fight. She's going to get it done by unanimous decision. Okay, next up, we've got Brian Kelleher taking on Journey Newsom here. For Brian Kelleher, uh, coming off two straight losses, given very tough fights back to back to the likes of Umar Nurmagomedov and Mario Bautista, losing both those fights by submission in the first round, both by Rene Naked Choke. But again, that's going to happen to you. I mean, Brian Kelleher, again, a decent fighter, but a fighter that's normally going to fight himself somewhere on the undercard. He's 36 years old. He's kind of been an undercard guy for most of his career. It's just that's just kind of how it's been. He was on a Conor McGregor main card against uh, the Picasso of MMA, my guy, in Ode Osborne back in January of 2020. But um, for Brian Kelleher, again, it has been, you know, when he does go to that next level against guys like Ricky Simone, like Umar Nurmagomedov, like Mario Bautista, those were his last three losses. He does go in there, he does lose, but those three guys are all very good. Mario Bautista's won his last four fights. Umar Nurmagomedov is 16-0 and he's undefeated. And for Ricky Simone, he is in the main event this week and, you know, he's on, what, a five-fight winning streak? I mean, Brian Kelleher does fight the best of the best, and when he does get guys that aren't you know, in all fairness, at that level, like Kevin Kroom, like Domingo Pilarte, he goes in there and he wins those fights. Um, 
But for Kalahari, again, 24 and 14 is the prof professional record. His last two fights, again, losing in the first round by rear naked choke. But again, before the Nurmagomedov and before, before the Bautista lost his back to back wins against Kevin Kroom and against Domingo Pilarte. And when Brian Kalahari is the better wrestler, Brian Kalahari usually does win the fight. And he's taken on a guy here in Jury Newsom who has struggled at times with the wrestling. His last fight, again, it's a loss to Sergey Morozov. Morozov's very good. Morozov beats him by unanimous decision. It was a fight that Morozov kind of needed to go in there and win. Of course, he, you know, picked up one against uh, Halle and Paiva before that, but lost to Douglas. Silva de Andrade before the Paiva uh, win. And, you know, Morozov goes in there. He dominates during Newsom on, on the ground. Before that, for Newsom, uh, beats Fernie Garcia by unanimous decision. It's a fight that Newsom outstrikes Garcia, and he goes in there. He doesn't really wrestle all that much, but he just really outstrikes Garcia for those 15 minutes. Lose to Randy Costa before that. Gets knocked out in the first round. Uh, has no contest against Domingo Perlarte. It's a fight that originally, um, you know, was won by Journey Newsom. Um, but, of course, that fight got overturned. I don't I don't remember entirely what uh, that got overturned for. And before that, for Newsom, his first fight in the UFC, losing to Ricardo Hamos in a fight that Hamos went in there. Um, just kind of outstruck Newsom out controlled him as well but again for Newsom, i would be concerned in this fight the wrestling i think brian kelleher by far is the better wrestler at these two guys i think on the feet i think they are fairly matched decently i think Newsom is the better striker we have seen him go in there and really when he sits down in his punches he can be dangerous in there Newsom does have some pop especially for being a 135 pounder and for a guy who let's just be honest is lower on the card in Newsom. but i think for brian kelleher he's going to go in here i think he's going to really wrestle junior Newsom, and i think he's going to win so that's why i'm going to take brian boom kelleher to go in here on the undercard i think he's going to go in there and win this fight by decision i think he's the better wrestler i think he's just going to really grapple with Newsom for 15 minutes i think brian kelleher the minus 185 favorite is going to go on to win this fight so it can be Kelleher to win by unanimous decision so Stephanie Edgar is a huge favorite in her fight here against Irina Alexeva Alexeva making her UFC debut coming in at plus 240 for the day for the debut only four and one so far in her professional career coming off a winner last fight against Stephanie Page winning by unanimous decision at Bellator 269 that was in Russia that was the Fedor and Tim Johnson card and for Tim Johnson actually just picking up a win against Saeed Soma in Hawaii just a couple nights ago so good win for Tim Johnson getting back on the winning track um but yeah for Alex Siva she goes in there she beats Stephanie Page by unanimous decision it was a fight that she won coming off a loss at Pro FC 66 in 2019 a card again in Russia where she did lose to Liliana Kazak by unanimous decision now she's getting the shot in the UFC, which I find a little bit interesting considering she did not fight in 2020. And just like that, they're booking her in the UFC against a fighter in Stephanie Egger, who Egger is 8-3. And, and for Egger, again, coming off a win in her last fight, she has won three out of her last four fights in the UFC. The only loss being to a fighter, Myra Bueno Silva, who the UFC is kind of high on. Bueno Silva's won her last three fights after dropping one to the Manon Fierro. And hey, Myra Bueno Silva is going to fight in two months against Misha Tate in a fight where I think if Myra Bueno Silva wins, Misha Tate will likely be done. But it's a fight, again, that shows you how much the UFC has put in the Myra Buena Silva if she's taken on a UFC or former UFC champion, of course, in Tate. But for Egger, again, coming off that one of her Aline Perez in her last fight, submitting her in the second round. And before that, for um, Egger, it is going to be a loss to Myra Buena Silva, but a win over Jessica Rose Clark and a win over Stephanie, or sorry, not Stephanie Egger, over Shane, Shana Young. And Egger's ground game is really good. Of course, her two last wins in the UFC have been by Rene Choke and by Armbar, the, the fight against Jessica Rose Clark. She goes in there, she submits Jessica Rose Clark within the first four minutes. Edgar's a good fighter on the ground, and she can really dominate, and she can really control her opponents down there. And for Irina uh, Alexeva here in this fight, I just think it's an all-around tough fight. For Edgar, um, this was the original booking for this fight, so Alexeva, again, signed by the UFC, not on short notice. The fights that I have seen with her, she is a decent wrestler, but she, you know, she is decent off her back. She's good with, um, she's just good all around a decent jiu-jitsu game. I saw her fight on RCC4 in 2019. It's really the only fight that I've watched of her other than the Stephanie Page fight. Um, again, she goes in there. It's a fight that, uh, Shlomenko's in the main event of. Victor Henry's on the card over in Russia in 2019. But it's a fight where Alexeva in the first round, or early in the first round, looks good with the wrestling. She gets reversed, um, towards the middle of that first round and then eventually pulls off an armbar and wins the fight. So it is something that I think Edgar has got to be a a little bit concerned with but I think Stephanie Egger will be able to ground Alexeva and I think she will be able to win I don't think it's going to be the point where Alexeva is going to be constantly threatening with submissions off her back I think Egger is able to keep top control and I think Egger is able to win the fight through that so give me the favorite here again there's a reason she's minus 300 um again especially against a fighter who's only had five professional fights give me Stephanie Egger to go in there and pick up the win I like her to win this fight by unanimous decision next up we've got the UFC debut here of Trey Waters the reigning LFA welterweight champion who'll be 
be taking on Josh Quinlan in a fight where I honestly think it's going to be pure violence. This should be a great one here. Again, for Quinlan, originally supposed to take on Angelosa in his original booking for this fight. Losa, of course, just had to withdraw just, I think, last night. So Trey Waters, on week's notice, is going to be taking this fight against Josh Quinlan. And Waters is a guy who... In his last fight, winning the LFA welterweight championship by uh, knocking out Jalen Fuller in the second round. He got a shot in the contender series in 2022, but he got submitted in the first round as a very dangerous guy in Gabriel Bonfim. Bonfim, a tremendous jiu-jitsu artist, a guy who just won his last fight against Munir Lezez with a mounted guillotine choke in 49 seconds at UFC 283 in Brazil. This is a guy who's dangerous in Bonfim, and there's no shame in losing to a guy like Bonfim, especially if you are Trey Waters. He got Von Flute in the first four minutes. It's going to happen, but for Waters and with that performance don't take away from the, the fact that Trey Waters has got a good wrestling game as well a really good you know solid grappling game as a whole this guy can go in there he can get it done on the ground if he needs to as well um and for Waters again his last fight though winning that fight by finish in the second round but especially with the a type a type of fight like this because he just won the LFA championship 15 days ago as of when this fight's gonna happen I mean as you're gonna see this video it's coming out on Sunday night nine days removed from his win at LFA 156 against Jalen Fuller. He's now turning it right around in a fight against Josh Quinlan. I think it's a, a style of fight where Waters will likely be able to go in there and he'll likely try to stand Quinlan as well. Again, taking this fight on short notice, nothing to lose in the UFC debut. You're probably going to see both these guys go in there. You're probably going to see both of them swing. I think it's going to make for a very interesting fight early on the card. Again, I think it's just going to be back and forth. I think it's going to be crazy on the feet, especially because, again, Quinlan's a guy who will go there. He will swing big and for one Waters, another guy who will do that as well, maybe a little more technical um, than Quinlan, but then Quinlan has got slightly more power than him. Again, you look at Quinlan's only fight in the UFC in, um, in the summer of 2020 going there and uh, finishing Jason Witt, knocking out the Vanilla Gorilla, one of like three Vanilla Gorillas in the UFC, but finishing Jason Witt within two minutes in the first round. I don't know if Quinlan, or I don't know if, uh, excuse me, Witt's still in the UFC, but for Quinlan, a very good win in his first fight in the UFC, winning on the contender series before that, got overturned, but still, Quinlan's a good guy in there i think this is going to be a crazy fight but between him and trey waters i'm going to be taking though josh quinlan to win the fight i know waters again just fought nine days ago but i think quinlan does have a slight power advantage and i think again i'm i'm expecting and i'm i'm anticipating a fight where both these guys are going in there and they're going to swing i'm going to take the guy who's got the slight power advantage in josh quinlan at least i think quinlan's got slight the slight power advantage and i think if waters is trying to take him down then quinlan is able to stay competitive in the wrestling aspect and able to keep this fight standing to the point where he can get waters and eventually finish him on the feet i think it's going to be again crazy non-stop action in the first round but i think it will be a fight that doesn't go past the first five minutes give me josh quinlan to win this crazy fight by first round knockout so this fight in the flyweight division between cody durden and charles johnson i think is completely dependent on if charles johnson can stay on his feet because i mean that's just kind of how this fight i think plays out we'll talk about it in a second but for charles johnson this is going to be his third fight in four months so far in 2023 in january he goes in there he beats jimmy flick and finishes him in the first round his next fight's a loss to Oday Osborne where he loses by split decision and then after that he you know now is getting the Cody Durden fight and don't forget he just fought in November 22 as well against Jaglas Jumagulov beating Jumagulov by split decision it's a fight that I don't think he won I think a lot of people thought Jumagulov won and thankfully for Jumagulov his retirement was short-lived as he will now be taking on Rafael Estivam um, next week in uh, New Jersey that's a very tough fight for Jaglas Jumagulov we'll see how that fight does go but for um, Charles Johnson again two and two so far in the UFC his first fight he comes in as the LFA champion after beating Carlos Moda finishing him in the fifth round of, of a very good fight in LFA Moda's the guy again who's in the UFC as well now losing to Cody Durden in his last fight comes to show but um for Johnson beating Muhammad Mok or sorry not did not beat Mohamed Mokayev loses to Mohamed Mokayev in his first fight by unanimous decision Mokayev goes in there just out wrestles Charles Johnson holds him down for about 12 minutes he takes him down 12 times it's a, it was a tough fight for Johnson coming into that one against Mokayev but it's all right Johnson after that beats Jogos Shumagulov beats Jimmy Flick and then of course has that fight with Picasso my guy Ode Osborne a lot of people were taking Charles Johnson in that one is another short notice opportunity for Johnson Ode goes in there and wins I thought Ode went there and won that fight um um, but a fight that a lot of people thought Charles Johnson maybe should have got the nod, but going into that one, a lot of people thought Charles Johnson was going to get it. Again, I stick by my guy, Noday Osborne. Noday Osborne went in there and won the fight. Anyways, um, 
But for Johnson, going back to this fight style against Cody Durden, you know what Durden's going to bring. Durden's going to try to go in there. He's going to try to wrestle you. Look at his last fight in October 2022 against Carlos Moda. I mean, 12 and a half minutes of control time for Cody, Cody Durden in that one. He only needed four takedowns. The first two rounds only needed two takedowns to acquire four minutes and 30 seconds of control time in the first and four minutes and 25 seconds of control time in the second. Third round, all Cody Durden as well. That's all Durden needs. Durden only needs just one takedown. He can hold you down there for the entirety of that round his other fight in 2022 is that win over jp bays in the saruki on gamrock card i feel like jp bays has been at the ufc for longer but honestly that fight was only back in 2022 bays gets knocked down in the first round and then durden before that drops a fight against muhammad mokayev in london in 58 seconds beats oreki long by unanimous decision the fight where durden goes into the post fight interview i think it was dc interviewing him and he just goes up and straight up says you know i had to go win this fight and i had to go send oreki long back to it where he came from and we're all like uh, wow okay D didn't think that was coming right there but Cody Durden he beats Oreki Long it, it doesn't take away from his good performance in that fight he beats Oreki Long he does really well with his wrestling in terms of that fight uh, but it was just kind of a shocking um, post fight interview it was just it was like Colby Covington without you know just it was Colby Covington but just in the second fight of the night and without like kind of the charisma of Colby Covington it was just it just came out of nowhere I think it caught a lot of people by surprise and um, then Jordan's first fight in the UFC probably I mean honestly when you look back at it one of his more impressive fights I know Chris Gutierrez just did lose to Pedro Munoz in a fight where it kind of just felt like he kind of laid an egg laid an egg against Munoz but a fight where he takes Chris Gutierrez all 15 minutes and he only loses or he doesn't lose they just draw it's a unanimous draw like it's not a bad fight for Durden at all um now he gets Charles Johnson again it's dependent on if Durden can take Johnson down I'm under the belief that I don't think he I think he can take Durden or Johnson down but I don't think he's gonna be able to hold Johnson down I know again Durden is really good at that he just does get one takedown he's gonna hold you down for the rest of the fight but I think Johnson is just a long fighter I think Johnson is a guy who's gonna be able to keep his distance his distance against Durden and I don't know how much Durden's gonna be able to be able to close the distance and take Charles Johnson down Johnson is a tougher guy to take down you saw Ode Osborne took him down a couple times so Ode was not able to hold Johnson down for most of that fight so I think Charles Johnson is able to go in there with stand the wrestling attack out of Cody Durden and I think Charles Johnson is going to be able to go out there and win this fight I think Johnson again keeps his distance uses his striking and wins the fight that way so give me Charles Johnson to beat Cody Durden I think he's going to get it done by unanimous decision all right next up we've got the ton levy taking on Pete dead game Rodriguez I just I'm, I'm just looking through some stuff right because as I do before I make each you know prediction and I'm just looking, okay, I just, I don't know how I just found this out, that Sajakub Karamov got released from the UFC. Apparently, I didn't see his original tweet. I don't know, that doesn't make any sense in the world. Now, hear me out. This is how I figured this out. I went Pete, Gabe, Pete Dead Game Rodriguez. I looked at Mike Jackson because I was just thinking to myself, okay, Mike Jackson's likely going to go to the PFL, I think, and fight Jake Paul and Jake Paul's first MMA fight. It just kind of feels like something that would make sense. But yeah, I go from Mike Jackson, then I click on his Muay Thai fight, so then I click on Jeremy Holloway. I see, oh, Jeremy Hall Holloway is fighting on XMMA 6. So I'm looking at XMMA May 6th of the main events, Francisco Rivera and Ricky Mendeos. And then I see, why is Sajikub Karamov on that card? And I'm like, oh my goodness, Kai, like it doesn't make any sense. Karamov's a guy who's two and one in the UFC, and he got released because he loses to who? What did he, who did he lose? Didn't he lose to Nurmagomedov? Like, it doesn't make any sense. I don't know why. I, yeah, I just I just figured that out. He lost to Said Sa Nurmagomedov, and now he's an ex-MMA. Anyways, going back to this fight with Natan Levy and Pete Rodriguez. For Pete Rodriguez, one and one in the UFC, I don't know where to rank this guy. And I don't know how to see this guy as a fighter because he said two fights in the UFC. One of them is against Jack Della Maddalena. And for JDM, this is a guy who's going to be fighting Sean Brady in his next fight at UFC 290. That card is absolutely stacked. But for Della Maddalena, again, this guy's 14-2. and two. He's won his last 14 fights. He's the guy who's probably going to be a title challenger, honestly, within his next three fights. And okay, of course, he knocks out Pete Dead Game Rodriguez in the first round. And then Pete Rodriguez goes from that to fighting probably the worst guy on the roster in Mike the Truth Jackson, a guy who his only professional win is is a fight where he got eye gouged by Dean Barry. That's his only win. Um, and I just find it's just weird. I just it's it's um it's just odd. Like that's how that's the level of competition Rodriguez goes goes from. And now he gets a guy in a ton levy who's eight and one. Levy's two and one in the UFC, wins over Hernaro Valdez in his last fight where he just went in there and out he out wrestled him in his last in his fight before that against Mike Breed in another fight where he 
He tried to wrestle Breeden, but really couldn't hold Breeden all that all that much down. So Levy goes back to his uh, karate roots, and he goes in there and he wins the fight that way. Um, Levy's not bad. His first fight losing to Hoffa Garcia. It's a fight where Garcia just kind of goes in there and out wrestles him. It's an interesting fight because again, Rodriguez is the guy who's going to go in there. He's going to he's a boxer. Pete Rodriguez is going to try to use his hands and he's going to try to knock out Natan Levy for Natan Levy again. That karate sort of style, but also mixed in with the wrestling does make him a little bit dangerous. At minus two seventy five, that's who I'm going to take. I'm going to take Natan Levy to win this fight again. I think the karate game out of Levy, his usage of his kicks, I think is going to be huge here. I don't think Rodriguez is really going to be able to, be able to get close and really swing swing big like he kind of did against Mike the Truth Jackson. Even though Mike Jackson a long fighter, but really not the most skilled. Fighter. Fighter. Um, and again, for Levy, I think if he has to, I think he can take Rodriguez down. I think that's the spot that Rodriguez really hasn't been tested all that much in. And I think it's a, a real bright spot in this fight, especially for Natan Levy will be in terms of wrestling. Um, so I think with the combination of both the wrestling and the and the karate style out of Levy, I think it's a fight that he could definitely go out there and win. I think it's a fight that he definitely will win. Um, it's just a matter of how he gets it done. I'm going to say Levy by decision. I think if Pete Rodriguez is going to win. It's going to be a big knockout. I think it's a fight that it's a, it's a stoppage that he just wings a big shot and he drops Levy and knocks him out. But I think in terms of my official prediction, I got Natan Levy to go in there and beat Pete Rodriguez. He's going to get it done by unanimous decision. In the heavyweight division, first to two in a row, we've got Martin Budai taking on Jake Collier. Budai, a very slight favorite in this one, coming in at minus 115, got minus 105 on the other side for Jake Collier. For Budai, 11 and 1 professionally, 2 and 0 so far in the UFC. Wins over both Chris Barnett and Lucas Bredsky. The last one over Bredsky being a very close split decision. Um, it's a fight where he gets outstruck in, um, but you know, I don't know. Honestly, when I rewatched that fight, I think Bredsky wins it. I think Budai got really lucky in the decision. I just, I, I don't know how you make the case for two rounds for Martin Budai in that fight. I'll just be honest with you. I'll be straight up. I, I, I think Bredsky wins that fight in San Diego. Uh, but Budai now gets Jake Collier for Collier, 13 and 8 professionally, coming off back to back losses to Chris Barnett in his last one at UFC 279. A guy that Budai beat in Barnett's debut, or sorry, in that Budai beat Barnett in Budai's debut. Um, I believe it was in 2021. It was in 2022. Technical unanimous decision victory for Budai. Budai knees uh, Barnett in the, in the midsection and the lower section needs him in the balls and Barnett can't continue so he gets the technical decision um because they go right to the scorecards and then for Collier before the Barnett loss at UFC 279 he goes in there he loses to um and Andre Arlovsky Arlovsky it's Arlovsky's you know run of just beating low-level heavyweights Arlovsky beats him by split decision before, before that for Collier beats Chase Sherman submits him by Renee Kachok in the first round loses to Carlos Felipe beats Jan Vellante and loses to Tom Ospinal before that and that's been the heavyweight run so far for Jake Collier I think Budai's better I just think he is I think Budai's got a better uh, striking game I think on the ground Jake Collier if he's ever if he's going to excel in this fight it will be through that but for Budai you know Get rid of the Lucas Bredsky fight. This guy is a good striker. He does have a lot of power. He can threaten with a lot of different stuff. And if you look at his win on the contender series against Lorenzo Hood, he goes in there and he knocks out Hood with a knee, um, just sits Hood right down and wins the fight by first round knockout. And again, even the fight against Barnett, he does drop Barnett in that fight. Um, he does drop him in that third round before, of course, the fight does get stopped. Um, of course, then they go to decision. Budai still wins. But... I mean, Martin Budai, I think this is a fight that he's going to go out there. I think he's going to beat Jake Collier. I think it, it, as, long as, as long as he avoids the ground game, because I think that is a spot that Budai really hasn't been, you know, tested all that much in, if we're being honest, I think he should be able to win. I mean, this is a guy, again, before the UFC, he was, you know, pretty much a perfect or 100% finish rate he only had one fight that had gone the distance um and now in back-to-back -back fights in the ufc he has seen back-to-back -back decisions um i think he beats jake collier again i think he doesn't allow collier to take him down so i think he avoids damaging he does he avoids danger with that aspect of things and i think on the feet i think budai does go out there i think I want to pick him by finish, but honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if we get another decision victory out of Martin Budai here. I think we see a third fight in a row for Martin Budai that ends in decision. I think it's one of these, again, heavyweight fights that, similar to, I guess, Mo Uzman and Junior Tafa, I think you see some crazy exchanges, but I think other than that, both guys tire. I think Budai just does enough to win the decision. So it's going to be Martin Budai to beat Jake Collier. He's going to get it done by unanimous decision. So on to the main card in our first fight is Marcos Rodrigo de Lima taking on uh, Waldo Cortez Acosta, who's apparently the salsa boy now i don't think he had that nickname in his last fight but there he is uh salsa boy and cortez acosta and for cortez acosta finally making that jump in competition we always talk about it it's the endless cycle of bad heavyweight fights fighters i mean okay 
Again, no disrespect to any of these guys. They are higher in the sport than I will ever make it. I am, I'm just, I'm not a fighter. I don't fight. But just as a, someone who watches the sport, it's the low, I, I wouldn't say bad, but the low level of the UFC heavyweight fighters. I'm talking about the Jared Vanderas. I'm talking about Chase Sherman. I'm talking about pretty much anyone Andre Arlovsky's beat. I'm talking about, um, Chase Sherman, I think I already said him, uh, you know, Jake Collier, I was kind of put in that list, just guys like that, you know, lower level guys, and Cortez Acosta in his first two fights fought those type of guys, and Vendera and Sherman, he beat both of them by unanimous decision, it's a fight that Cortez Acosta didn't take too many risks, and he stayed on the outside, and he just outstruck both those guys to a unanimous decision, okay. Now Cortez Acosta makes that slight leap in competition. He now gets a guy in, uh, Marcos Rodrigo de Lima, who has won three of his last four fights, then he lost being to, to Obligoy Ivanov by unanimous decision in Arizona at UFC 274. His last fight, beating Andrei Arlovsky in the first round by Rene Kachok, is a fight that he drops Arlovsky early in the first round, takes Arlovsky's back and submits him. And before that fight against de Lima, beating Ben Rothwell by knocking Rothwell out in the first round in 30 seconds, is the fight that eventually you know sends Rothwell outside of the UFC, now onto bare knuckle fighting. He won his first fight in bare knuckle in 19 seconds. We'll see what he does in his next fight on that card. Main event, main event ended by Mike Perry and Luke Rockhold. He's going to be taking on Josh Copeland in his next fight. We'll see how that goes for Rothwell. It's a fight that I think he's probably going to win. Taking on a guy in Copeland who was once the PFL runner-up in 2020, sorry, 2018, where Felipe, the season that Felipe wins ended up winning. Um, but... For DeLima, again, beats Ben Rothwell, sends him out the UFC, beats Morty Screen before that. We'll see what we get out of Delima here, because Delima's a guy who has got a lot of power on the feet. He's got some pop, and it's a, it's, I think it's a, it's a tough fight for Cortez Acosta, considering I think, though, Cortez Acosta can kind of, you know, parlay that same type of game plan and fight style that he did against Sherman and Vandera into this one with Delima, for being honest. I think it's a fight style that Cortez Acosta can stay on the outside, use some of his kicks, and just be a technical striker, especially at the heavyweight division. It's a style that you know, might not be the most entertaining as style that might not produce the most knockouts, but it's a fight style that will win you fights. And, you know, in a sport like this, it's a, it's a sport where you need to produce wins for both money purposes, as Bobby Green um, definitely uh, showed um, after his fight against Jared Gordon, or at least the press conference. And it's just, again, it's a fight style that I think Cortez Acosta can bring to the table. I think he can win it. Even at plus 115, I like Cortez Acosta to go in here and beat Marcos Rodrigo de Lima. I think he's going to go out there. I think he's going to um, just outstrike de Lima. I don't think he's going to let de Lima put his power shots into him. I think he's going to just, you know, stay on the outside and outstrike de Lima Technically, and just, you know, with the volume, I think he's going to win this fight. Again, not allowing DeLima to put a big shot in him and not allowing DeLima to knock him out. So, give me Salsa Boy. Give me Cortez Acosta to stay with his winning track here in the UFC. I don't think he'll get a finish, but I think he'll beat DeLima, and I think he'll get it done by unanimous decision. Next up, we got Juicy J, Juliana Rosa back in there against Fernando Padilla and Padilla's first fight um, in the UFC. And for Padilla... You know, come in and off the Fury FC looking for a fight. I'm assuming that's where you guys contract with the UFC. I'm just assuming. Um, I am, I'll be honest with you, I haven't watched looking for a fight in a while. Um, it's a fight that Mana Martinez is on. He beat Jose Johnson on that card. But anyways, for Padilla, goes in there. He beats Cameron Graves, knocks him out in the second round with an elbow to win the Fury FC Featherweight Championship. And after that, gets a shot against uh, Sean Soriano. Fight never happens because of visa issues with Padilla. So fight doesn't happen. Padilla then is now booked against Julian Arosa. I feel like it's a big step down in competition for Arosa. It just is. I mean, what are we doing here? This is a guy who is on a huge winning streak. He won three in a row with likes of Charles Air Jordan, Steven Peterson, and Hakeem Dawadu. And then he goes from that, he drops a fight to Alex Caceres. Okay, it's gonna happen to you. Caceres is very good. This is a top 15 guy in Alex Caceres. He's fighting Daniel Pineda coming up in a couple months. He's probably gonna beat Pineda. And this is a guy again, Caceres, who has had a million fights in the UFC. Bruce Leroy's really good in, in a row so lost. It's gonna happen to you, right? And they, get, they go, he goes from that to fighting a guy who hasn't fought in the UFC yet in Francisco Padilla. I think it's just a terrible matchup for Padilla here. This is a guy who, sure, is decent on the feet and is good on the ground. You can fight off submissions, but it's not like Arosa is, you know, a guy who does have a lot of submissions when, submission wins in the past. I mean, you look at his, what he's got, he's got 12 submission wins, but he's got also 11 by finish on the feet. Arosa isn't dependent on a ground game. He can go to the feet and he can mix it up with you striking wise. He can take a punch. He is willing to go back and forth. Um, with his hands, 
I think that's the type of fight we're gonna get here. I mean, you've seen the flying knee finish in the Apex early in 2021 against Nate Landwehr. He's got power on the feet, but he can also go the full 15. He can also get into, in this, into a straight up war with you as well. I just think this is a fight that is kind of disrespectful for Arosa. And I think even on the ground, I think Arosa's got the advantage. I think Padilla is dangerous sword on the feet, but I just think Arosa is better everywhere. I, I think this is a guy, again, Julian Arosa, who has really shown out in his second stint in the UFC. He's 6-6 six and six overall with the UFC, but that's counting his first run in the promotion, or his first two runs in the promotion that weren't very good where he didn't get a win. And since then, he's been very excellent in the UFC. This is a guy who's been 5-2 and two in the UFC in this third run in the promotion. I think Arosa runs straight through Padilla here. I think he does. I think he went, he'll win it by decision, but I think it's a 30-27. And don't get me wrong. I think Francisco, Francisco Padilla is going to throw back at, him, back at him. And I think Arosa will take some damage in this fight just because of the fight style that he does fight. But in the end, I still like Juicy J to go out here and win. I think Arosa is going to win this fight by unanimous decision. I think you get back and forth on the feet. And I think if you have to switch it up, I think Arosa, even though Padilla is a decent ground fighter and has shown that he is decent down there as well, I still think Arosa is better than him on the ground and that's why i think juicy j julian rosa goes out here and he beats francisco padilla he's gonna get it done by unanimous decision next up we've got hadolfo Vieira taking on cody brundage it's an interesting stylistic matchup because that's really how every Hadolfo Vieira fight is. He just lost his last fight back in the summer of 2022, dropping unanimous decision loss to Chris Curtis. And the action man, of course, gets him by decision. It's a fight where Hadolfo Vieira can't take Curtis down. He tries a lot. He goes 0 for 20 and he can't bring Curtis down. So he just loses the fight because Chris Curtis just outstrikes him for 15 minutes. It's what's going to happen. That's just what Chris Curtis will do to you if you can't get him down, especially in a fight. Actually, that's just what's going to happen more to Adolfo Vieira in a fight where he can't get a takedown. Um, and we'll see what happens in this one, because that's really every Adolfo Vieira fight. Vieira, let's just say it how it is. He's likely not going to win a fight if he can't get it down. That's, he's, again, the guy is a tremendous jiu-jitsu player. He is probably maybe the best jiu-jitsu guy in all the UFC. The guy, again, his nickname is the Black Belt Hunter. Hadolfo Vieira is on a different level in terms of jiu-jitsu, but he's got to get it down there first. And we'll see if Cody Brundage can, you know, if Brundage can do that. If Brundage can keep it on the feet. Because, again, you look at Brundage's run so far in the UFC. He's 2-2 two two his first fight. Nick Maximov. It's a fight that he loses to Maximov. He gets taken down four times. And Maximov kind of just rides rides the you know the wrestling and all that he just he just rides the grappling to victory he wins it two rounds to one then in Brundage's next fight he beats Dolce Lujambula in a fight where Lujambula is looking good early the fight only lasts three last three minutes but Lujambula goes in there wobbles Brundage early Brundage though locks in a guillotine and Brundage ends up winning the fight in a big scramble then after that for Brundage he goes in there he knocks out Treshawn Gore in the first round Treshawn Gore is a guy who after the Brundage fight finally picked up a win in the UFC but then they said oh okay you finally win one go ahead you can go fight Bo Nickel and then for Brundage after that he drops the fight to Michelle Ozil Shashek who we're going to talk about just in a few moments after this fight Ozil Shashek goes in there and knocks out Brundage the fight that Brundage kind of tries to, tries to rely on his wrestling when he can't hold Ozil Shashek down Ozil Shashek lands a big shot, puts him away, and wins the fight by finishing him on the ground. So now you get Brundage and Hodolfo Vieira, and Brundage is a guy, though, who does kind of rely on his wrestling in the UFC, too. So we'll see, again, how that translates into a fight where Hodolfo Vieira, which, again, Hodolfo Vieira is trying to, at all times, get the fight to the ground as well. So I think it makes for an incredible stylistic matchup. It's just a matter, again, if Brundage can take, uh, or sorry, Vieira can take Brundage down, or if can he trap him and can he get him in a spot on the ground where he can, again, go in there and submit Brunage? I think he's going to be able to. I think he's going to catch Brunage at some point. Vieira is a minus 275 favorite in this fight because, again, of the grappling, because of the jujitsu. Again, I will say it every single time. The guy's nickname is the Black Belt Hunter. He goes out there and he tries to submit Black Belts. I think Vieira is able to do that against Brunage. I think he's going to find a way to get him, get him down. And again, it only takes one takedown. It only takes one slip. It only takes, really, one moment for Vieira to... To have you on your back or have you on the ground and he's gonna find a way to fish for a submission he's gonna get you and he's gonna again squeeze the living hell out of you or look for a lo arm lock or something like that i think Hadolfo vieira goes in there i think he'll submit cody brennage i think we'll get it done honestly in the first round i think he's just gonna find a way to get him to the ground i think vieira's gonna find a submission early so give me Hadolfo vieira to get back on the winning track give me Hadolfo vieira to beat cody brennage by first round submission. Clash of Styles here in our co-main event between Kyle Borjaio and Michelle Ozil Shashek. And
And again, for Kyle Barhio, back in the UFC octagon, another co-main event spot for him. He had two in his first two fights in the UFC against Gazi Omar Gajiev, where he beats him by unanimous decision, and then a unanimous decision co-main event win over Armand Petrosian. Again, all, all of Borjaio's co-main events come in, you know, fight night cards that aren't very good. You know, it's just kind of how it is. And now he's back in his last fight. It's a fight on a pay-per-view card, UFC 280, of course, headlined by Charles Oliveira and Islam Mahashev. And on the prelims, Kyra Borjaio goes in there and beats Mahmoud Muradov by unanimous decision. Kyra Borjaio is good. You know, it was a fight against Muradov where, you know, I thought he was going to win, but I was questionable on it. But you know Bor what Borjaio is going to do. He is going to try to go in there and he is going to try to wrestle you. And he's going to try to bring you to the ground. He's going to attempt some submissions, but he is primarily a ground fighter who lives and relies on his ground game. And that's kind of what we're going to see in this one again with Michelle Zolshechek. I don't think, obviously, Borjaio is not a guy who is going to strike with you. That's just not what he does. Borjaio is not going to want to strike with a power threat and a very big power threat in Michelle because that's what Michelle Ozil-Shashek is going to bring. You look at his last two fights in the UFC, both knockouts, and his last three wins in the UFC are all by knockout. He's 6-3 and three in the promotion. His last fight being that first round knockout win over Cody Brundage, and before that, the finish, the knockout against Sam Alvey. Again, Sam Alvey's not a guy who was making a, you know, he just, he wasn't winning fights, just just in general, he wasn't winning fights. He's going to have a fight, does Alvi, um, in about a month. He's going to be fighting at B2 Fighting Series um, in the main event for the B2, or not for a championship, sorry, in a co-main event spot against, or in Columbus, Georgia, against Cam Graham. Cam Graham's a guy who's 5-12, and 12, and Sam Alvey's going to be fighting him at heavyweight, and Cam Graham's a guy who is a big heavyweight. This is a big guy. He's 5-12 and 12 professionally. I think Sam Alvey's finally going to pick up a win, uh, at least I hope. Um... But yeah, for uh, for Michelle Zolchechek, he knocks out Sam Alvey. He loses to Dustin Jacoby by, before that by unanimous decision. Beats Shamil Gamzatov by knockout in the first round. Beats uh, Medessa Bukowskis by split decision before that. Drops a fight to Jimmy Crew and Ovin St. Crew before that. And then finishes God's... Uh, 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 and Tukulov and Jan Volante before that, both by finish by TKO in the first round. Again, that's great and all. Michelle Zolchechek's a fighter that who's really coming into his own, like 28 years old, and putting together really, some really nice wins as a whole. He's won four of his last five fights. But my problem with Michelle Zolchechek is, especially in this fight, you know what Cairo Borjaio is going to try to do to him. Borjaio is going to try to go in there. Borjaio is going to try to wrestle him. Borjaio is going to try to get him to the ground. And in all likeliness, Cairo Borjaio is likely going to ground Michelle Zolchechik in this fight. And he's likely just going to lay on him for five for 15 minutes. That's kind of just what Cairo Borjaio does. Um, he does have some good jujitsu skills. And he can, you know, he's decent down there as well, even with his strikes. But he just doesn't really show it all that much. And his... Three fights so far in the UFC, it's just been all Borjaio taking down his opponents, just kind of laying on them and just riding it out to decision. And especially when his opponent, his opponent can't build back up to his feet and can't get back standing, that's just what Borjaio is going to do to you. And if, again, Ozil Shechek has nothing to offer him back, there's nothing, you know, Borjaio is not going to be in any danger. He's not going to really have to try anything else on the ground. He's just going to hold his opponent down for 15 minutes. And I think that's exactly what this fight's going to be, just like Borjaio's first three fights in the UFC. I think it's just going to be takedowns out of Borjaio. I think he's going to be the better wrestler, obviously. He's going to be the better grappler. And he's not going to allow Michelle Zolchechek to get back up to his feet. So I think Kyra Borjaio here at minus 300 is going to beat Michelle Zolchechek. I don't think it's going to be the most impressive fight at all. I don't think, I think it's just going to be a typical Apex co main event that no one's really excited for. And I think it's just going to be a fight that we just get up on over with. But Kyra Borjaio is going to go in there and I think he's going to beat Michelle Zolchechek, limiting the power and just stopping the whole striking game as a whole. Kyra Borjaio goes in there and beats Michelle Zolchechek in the co-main event. He's going to get it done by unanimous decision. And here, from here, folks, we have our main event between Ricky Simone and Song Yudong. I've already talked about that fight since it was scheduled as the co-main event last week on that card main event by Sergei Pavlovich and Curtis Blades. By the way, a tremendous performance by Sergei Pavlovich. I don't know why Curtis Blades decided to go in there and become a striker against Pavlovich. Didn't make any sense to me because, again, there was a pathway to victory for Curtis Blades in that fight, and it was through wrestling, but he decided, you know what, I'm just going to go strike with Sergei Pavlovich. Didn't make all that much sense. But anyways, the co-main event last week was supposed to be Ricky Simone and Song Yudong. We already talked about that fight last week. We're just going to roll that same prediction, and I'll see you guys next week for the pay-per-view in New Jersey of the Prudential Center between Aljamain Sterling and Henry Cejudo. Should be a good one to get for the Bandweight Championship. We're gonna, but we're going to roll Song Yudong and Ricky Simone right now. And folks, thank you for watching. Make sure to that subscribe button down below for more, and enjoy the main event prediction. Huge co-main event, Ricky Simone, Song Yadong. I mean, just a huge fight at 135 pounds. Two guys in the top 10, and Ricky Simone currently on a huge five-fight winning streak after dropping back-to-back -back fights in a fight where, ooh, the, the 
Uriah Faber fight where he gets knocked down the first round and losing to Rob Font right after, but he's won five fights since that two fight skid to Ray Borg, Gaetano Perella, Perello, uh, Brian Keller, Rafael Sunsell, and Jack Shore. And for Ricky Simone, he's he continues to find second round finishes. You look at the Gaetano Perello fight, second round submission, Rafael Sunsell, second round knockout, and the Jack Shore fight, a second round arm triangle um, submission. So for Ricky Simone, again, there's been a lot of wrestling and it's been, you know, just him finding ways to win fights. It's been through the wrestling or through the stand-up game. I mean, hell, he, he knocks down Jack Shore in their fight in, at, uh, on Long Island in 2022. He knocks down Rafael, Rafael Sunsell in 2021. Ricky Simone is getting more comfortable with his hands to the point where it's becoming pretty good. I mean, it's just a really good, you know, balance with his wrestling. It's the wrestling of Simone and his striking as a whole. He's becoming a really well-balanced fighter that can really get it done everywhere. And Ricky Simone comes in this fight the favorite against Song Yudong. He got Simone at minus 150 against the underdog in Song Yudong at plus 115. And for Song Yudong coming off that main event loss to Corey Santagin, it's a fight where Santagin eventually gets the finish in the fourth round or at the end of the fourth round because of a cut to Song Yudong because Song Yudong can no longer continue. And in all fairness, I thought Corey Santagin was winning that fight pretty handedly going up to that point. I had it 3-1 for Santagin. I think a lot of people had it 2-2. Two, two. Um, you can make the case 4-0 Santagin. I had it 3-1 Santagin going into the fifth, and the fight was stopped. So I thought Santagin was on his way to win no matter what, but still he gets finished in the, at the end of the fourth round. And before that, for Yudong, at three straight wins. It starts with a win over Casey Kenny by split decision at UFC 265. That fight should not have been a split decision. It was a pretty dominant performance for Song Yudong. He knocks out Julio Arce after that, and then he goes in. He knocks out Marlon Moraes in the first round um, on that Santagin. Sanka live card in March of 2022 and all fairness stuff that was on the that was the time and it's I guess we're still on that timing with Marlon Moraes where he just keeps getting knocked out you have the knockout loss to Corey Santig and the finish against Rob Son Rob Font the finish against uh, Marab Duvalashili the finish against Song Yudong the finish against Shane Moraes and now the finish against Brandon Lofnane he has lost his last six fights all by finish given the Lofnane fight wasn't by knockout it was by leg kicks I doubt Marlon Moraes sees his second fight in the PFL if he does see it for the love of God, give him the worst 145 pounder they have and let him beat up their worst 145 pounder, which is likely Hiyoji Kudo for the love of God. Actually, no, he'd get knocked out by Hiyoji Kudo. I forgot Kudo's got power. I don't know. Give him I, Jesus Pinedo. I don't know. It's bad. I mean, I don't know who Moraes can beat in that 145 pound weight class. And it's not like it's all that good, but it's just, oh my goodness, he keeps losing. Anyway, for Song Yudong, he beats Marlon Moraes, and now they give him, the, after that, they give him the Santagin fight. He does not beat Santagin, and here we are with him and Ricky Simone. Okay, so Song Yudong is going to have the striking advantage, obviously. Simone, we've talked about it. His striking is getting better, and it's getting on par to what his wrestling is. But it's not going to be to the point where he can rely on that against Song Yudong. It's just that simple. He's going to have to mix it up with the wrestling. And again, he can, his, his striking will definitely complement his, or his wrestling will definitely complement his striking. His striking is going to get better because of always the threat of the takedown from Ricky Simone, and that's what he's going to have to threaten a lot with here in this fight against Song Yudong. Yudong's a guy that's got a really good takedown defense. He doesn't get taken down all that often. Kyler Phillips took him down a couple times when they fought in 2021. Marlon Chido Vera took him down, and Cody Stamen was able to take him down a lot as well when they fought in DC back in 2019 to a, to a majority decision. But that's the game plan I think Ricky Simone's got to have in this fight. I don't think he can fall in love with his hands to the point where he's just striking the entire fight with Song Yudong because eventually I think he'll get finished. Yadong has got power in his hands. He's got, you know, he he can knock you out with his shots. So I think for Simone again, he's got to get he's got to get inside. He's got to close distance. He's got to fire off close shots and eventually tie up and get this fight down to the ground. And I think that's going to be something he's going to be really successful in doing so. I think just Simone's very physically strong in there. I don't know if Simone's able to fight, or sorry, I don't know if Song Yadong is able to fight off all the takedowns Simone is going to bring him. I think Simone really again is going to be able to go in there and just push him back up against the fence. I think he's going to be pressuring Song Yudong for majority of this fight, and I think that's what's going to push Ricky Simone towards victory. I think, again, the striking, it's going to be a lot of the wrestling, but in some points as well, the striking will play a factor as well, and I think in moments where they're not wrestling, I think again, Simone will be able to catch him with a couple strikes and go back to wrestling as well. I think it's just, again, going to be a mix-up of styles in this fight for Ricky Simone, and at, and at minus 140, I like him to go in there. I, th I don't think he's going to get a finish, but I think Ricky Simone's able to win a decision. Give me Simone to stay on his little win streak, He's going to beat Song Yudong by unanimous decision.